PayPal shut our accounts down. Chase shut our accounts down. American Express turned everything off. Our merchant processors turned everything off. Like we were blacklisted. We could not do business anywhere online. Um, There's no loans we could get to cover this loss because the money had stopped flowing in. So they couldn't see any of this. And they're like, yeah, if you don't have a merchant account, we can't give you a loan. Like this is not happening. Um, and we had loans, you know, because when you're doing that much revenue, money just comes to you. Welcome to Beyond the Fail, the podcast where we talk to leaders and entrepreneurs about their biggest business failures. We'll deep dive into how they overcame these setbacks, the lessons they learned from them, all to help you gain valuable insights. Failure is an essential part of the business journey, as well as being the key to success. So we're here to show you how to thrive from it. Today on Beyond the Fail, we have Jeff Barnes, a seasoned entrepreneur, ex-US Navy submariner and scuba diver, digital strategist, and two-time best-selling author. Over the years, Jeff has worn many hats, from running a nuclear power plant on a submarine to managing remote teams globally before the age of Zoom. His experiences have been nothing short of diverse. Jeff has traveled the globe, identifying funding tech companies, whilst also integrating cutting edge technology into global 100 corporations. And as a mentor and advisor, Jeff has left an incredible mark, guiding thousands of entrepreneurs through the intricacies of business. He's not only generated over $1 billion in capital for his clients, but has also played a pivotal role in helping numerous businesses past the $100 million mark in sales. In this episode, Jeff will share the highs and lows of his entrepreneurial journey from his remarkable achievement of taking an e-commerce business from zero to 17 million pounds in just eight months and to the challenges he faced in this business, including the daunting task of refunding 50,000 customers after a supplier went AWOL. Stay tuned for an insightful conversation as we uncover the secrets behind building empires and scaling technology businesses. This is Beyond the Fail with Jeff Barnes. Jeff, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for coming on. Jeff, take us back. Where did it start for you in business? When did it start? Well, first off, thanks for having me here, Jez. I really appreciate it. Um, plenty cold and rainy out here in the Seattle area today as well. So, you know, similar climates for us. Um, you know, it's hard to say, right? My my story starts long before I ever got into the working world when I was watching my dad, who was self-employed, um, have great years and then have miserable years, ups and downs, ups and downs. And um, there was a real low point when at one point we didn't have a, a place to live anymore. Uh, his his business partner had stolen from him and ended up in a situation where we didn't have a we didn't have a house. And that was uh, that was a little bit you know earth shattering for me. Um, but it, it really spent the time. Uh, at that point, I was about uh, 12, 13 years old. So for me, that was one of those situations like, okay, I never want this to happen in my life. Like, we're not going through this. So for me, it was, hey, you are not going to go into business when you get out of high school and go into the real world. Um, I ended up in the Navy. I was uh, running a nuclear power plant on a submarine as a mechanic and scuba diver. And along the way, I realized this is not for me. You know, I was really good at it. I was actually really, really good at what I did. But it was this lack of, you know, personal sovereignty, a you know, lack of control of my future and where I wanted to go and what I wanted to do. And having, you know, the military kind of running the show for me was not really my idea of fun after a while. So when I was 21 years old, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. I uh, was very fortunate and later in my life to, to get a chance to meet Robert and hang out with him and smoke a cigar. But, you know, along the way, I realized, man, this you're, he's right. You know, the tax system, the entire system is completely rigged against you for having a job. They're taking more than half of my paycheck for everything besides me. And it was it was quite frustrating. So I dabbled in things like being a, a contract hauler, contra, or a, a garbage hauler contractor, right? So trying to go and contract with these big hotels to change up their, their waste management programs. And I was terrible at that. I was terrified of doing it. I didn't like it. Then I learned about real estate investing. So I got started in real estate investing in 03, bought my first house for no money down, bought a couple more along the way and managed to lose my shirt and and then some during the financial crisis. So there was that issue. Um, I became a financial planner for a while because I wanted to learn how money worked. 
and thought this would be a great way to do that. And then I realized after doing that for a year or so that all I was was a glorified salesperson selling mutual funds and life insurance. And I hated that. So yeah, I had to try a lot of things. Um, along the way, I was in a big finance. I got out of the Navy, was in a big financial services company doing risk management and stuff and operations, engineering types of things. And that's kind of where things started you know, slowly coming together, right? I learned that I was very, very good and methodical at building processes and systems and leveraging technology and innovation and tying that all into the business world. And I got my MBA and said, okay, there's, there's something here. I don't know what it is. And it took me a really, really long time to figure it all out. And I'd say that still to this day, I, I get to figure good things out regularly. But um, it was one of those situations where I had a skill set that I didn't realize no one else really had. And what that came down to was really being able to marry the worlds of financial, finance, financial aspects, business operations, technology, and innovation, and putting that all together in a way that actually made sense to help companies grow. So it was a long and story journey to get to actually being an entrepreneur, if you will. What do you think your time in the Navy taught you and how have you kind of used those lessons in business? Uh, taught me more than, yeah, I've probably forgotten more than I, I learned, I remember now, but, um, the, the big thing about it being in the military is you learn, you learn discipline, right? Whether you want it or not, you learn this discipline and it's for no other reason than other people are counting on you to get something done. And if you let those people down, then there are consequences, right? And sometimes physical consequences, sometimes there are, you know, like, I, mean, I, I remember doing burpees, uh, we call them eight count bodybuilders and having to do a thousand of those. And after yeah. about 200 of them, I could barely move, you know? And so I never got to the full thousand, but you know, I, I went through hell in a, in a few instances by, because I let other people down. So you, you learn how to take responsibility and get things done. And I also learned along the way that I get bored really easily. <laughs> and so we had a saying in the Navy that there's nothing more dangerous than a bored nuke. And that's what we call ourselves as nukes because we worked in the nuclear engineering world. And it's true, right? You get bored and it, you're getting bored because we do this thing called three knots to nowhere, which is you're out on mission, you're patrolling, but you're literally going three knots in the ocean. And when you're in a submarine, there's no windows, there's no doors. You're not like, mm -hmm. you know, going out and having a vacation. This is you're in an industrial environment underneath the water and nothing changes. And so you, you tend to get bored. So I applied that that boredom into learning and I became a voracious reader and edu self educator. And those, those skill sets right there, the discipline and the ability to fill my boredom with self learning, um, has really propelled me in my career. Yeah. I mean, obviously they are two key traits to kind of any kind of entrepreneur and business leader. I'm hundred percent. It's interesting about the, the boredom point. Was that why, in some ways, you did a lot of moving around after you came out of the, the, the Navy because you kind of got bored in some of those jobs? Were they, some of them didn't maybe match the, I don't know, the the, the potential kind of adrenaline of, of being in, in the military? Yes and no. Um, it wasn't really an adrenaline thing. It was more a matter of, um, you know, mental atrophy, I guess is what you might call it. Right. I was good. Well, I was yeah. to the point where I just didn't feel like I was living up to my potential. You know, um, I knew I could do more. I knew I wanted to do more and I was tired of being told I couldn't. And so even while I had a career, I was doing a lot of all those other things I mentioned earlier were all side hustles for me. Cause I was, I was still working for a company and I luckily was smart enough, you know, pressured enough or just lucky enough to get a job where I could have autonomy and I could learn and I could constantly apply myself while still getting paid and doing a job. And I did my job really well, but that, that boredom was more, um, stymied the fact of, you know, am I really going to have what I want in life if I continue down this path? And if, even if the answer is yes, how long is that going to take? Is it going to literally take me that 40 years to get to a point where I can retire and hopefully have a great life on half the income I have at that point, you know, that didn't appeal to me. And so it was this, this hunger 
to always find something better than what I was currently doing, which made me bored with the situation I was in. Mm. And and that kind of moving around, it sort of sounds like a bit of experimentation, trying to find your your feet, maybe trying to find your purpose as well. Was would that be fair? Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah, I like doing things. Um, I don't like telling people things. So, you know, when yeah, even though I was really good at a lot of things, a lot of people are like, oh, go be a consultant. And I live in the Seattle area where there's any number of businesses are built around consulting for big companies like Microsoft and Boeing and Amazon and mm. on and on, right? And there's entire industries of the cottage industries of just being those software consultants that these companies hire. And there was just something that did not appeal to me uh, about consulting other people. And I think it came back to this whole, you know, it, those who can't do teach, right? Mm. And I really like doing the work and actually getting things done. And so consulting didn't really fit, even though that was probably the most logical thing for me to do. And I, I do that now. I consult and I advise because I finally feel like I've gotten the experience and earned that mm. that right. Whereas before, I didn't feel like I earned that. And when you're in the military, almost no one in the civilian world has any idea what you're capable of. I say almost because there are people that have learned over the years when they've hired other veterans um, how to handle that. But no one knew, no one knows, like, if I asked you to give me a job description or even come close to what does a, an MM1 do on a nuclear power plant or a, a submarine, it's really, really hard to even ascertain what those words even mean, let alone put it down on paper what I did on a daily basis, right? Mm. Not to mention the discipline, the focus that I, I gained. And so in the corporate world, you know, they kind of try to pigeonhole you, put you into this job that's going to make sense. Well, because I was doing all these other things, there there wasn't like a job description where I could say, hey, yeah, I fit that one. I want to go after that. And because of that, they also don't tell you all these different businesses and careers and opportunities that are out there in the world. And I didn't know. I didn't know what was available to me. I didn't know where I could go. And so I had to just kind of feel my way around. And something you said earlier, I wanted to kind of circle back to because I think it's relevant here as well. Um is that you said that because of your, I suppose, some of the issues that your dad had as, a, as an entrepreneur in his life, you didn't want to um, be, well, follow his path. But, in, you know, you, you actually ended up doing that. What, at that point, really put you off and then how, what kind of changed over time and how did you sort of you lose that that kind of uncertainty and fear that you obviously had from those experiences when you were younger? Yeah, it's a good question. You know, and the thing is, even though we didn't really have a place to live and it was you know kind of embarrassing having to live out of a, um, you know, a trailer, a, a friend's trailer, just so we had a roof over our head and all that, I didn't talk to anybody about that when I was a kid. I never kind of lit on I like I was embarrassed by that um but I have to say my parents always had you know it wasn't like we were sleeping on the streets so it wasn't that kind of homeless but um you know we had food in our bellies and we were taken care of so I never really had to get quite as scrappy as I think some people a lot of people in this world do right um but there was an embarrassment with that and there was a fear of failure and so that, of course, prevented me from wanting to go be that kid that wanted to have his own lemonade stand or, you know, go learn how to sell newspapers or go sell my own lawn mowing services when I was in high, whatever it was, right? I, I had this, like, fear of failure, like, oh, my gosh, I had seen my dad doing it. And I think that was all subconscious. That wasn't, like, an actual fear. However, I do remember when I started getting involved in real estate investing and buying properties and talking to investors, I would have, like, physical anxiety about talking to people. And mm. that was really, really hard to overcome. It, it took a long time. That was actually most, the most terrifying thing in the world for me was talking to somebody I didn't know, trying to convince them to either sell me their house or invest in a property and me being able to then get them some sort of return. And that fear was a result of that fear of failure, right? And will I fail? What happens if this doesn't work out? And on and on and on. Now, mind you, I didn't even get into that until after I'd already gone through six years in the military. I'd become a scuba diver. diver. I'd raised to an E6 in the military. I was in charge of the quality control problem. Like, I, 
had a lot of accolades at that point, and I still had this massive anxiety. So how I overcame those types of things was repetition, continue to get back up and do it over and over again. And eventually, over time, I, I think as Ken McElroy talks about the situational leadership, right? We have these quadrants we go through. You know, quadrant one is I'm excited, but I don't know anything. Quadrant two is, oh crap, I'm losing my excitement because I know that I don't know everything. Quadrant three is, okay, I'm getting confident. I know how I'm doing this. It's really good. Um, I'm, I'm able to start actually implementing this and I feel knowledgeable and that confidence there. And then quadrant four is I can teach others this. I'm, I'm the expert. Mm -hmm. And so everybody goes through that learning curve in practically everything. Actually, I think it is everything if we were to break it down because you aren't the expert. And my fear came from, well, you need to be the expert in order to succeed. And that's not entirely true. What you need to do is you need to have forward progress at all times, right? You know, here in the States, it's the NFL, right? You know, American football, as you guys call it. Um, but we call it forward progress because our goal is to get 10 yards over the course of four plays. It doesn't mean you have to have 10 yards in one play. It doesn't mean you have to have eight yards. You just have to keep getting that forward momentum, right? And if you keep doing that and you do it well enough and you do it long enough, you will win the game, right? And that's the mentality I eventually adopted. And it didn't come to me naturally on, on this aspect, on the money aspect, because there was that fear. So I think it was just realizing that there's other areas of my life that I was actually really good at. And I could apply that same mentality and that belief system over to this other area. It just took a lot of time and a lot of repetition. Interesting. Do, do you think that thing you just mentioned about you had that belief of thinking you had to be the, uh, an expert in something to sort of succeed, did that come from the military? Because I presume that that was the, well, I don't know. I mean, you tell me, is that what is taught? Is that the culture of the military? Not really, believe it or not. I mean, think about it. You have a 19-year-old kid straight out of high school with no college education running a nuclear power plant, right? So it, it's it's actually the the inverse of that, which is we need to break it down into such bite-sized manageable pieces that even a monkey could do this, yeah. you know, for lack of a better term, right? But the the reality is that there's training involved. There's massive amounts of training. And that training is meant to make it so that it is very easy for you to understand what's happening and then act or react in a moment's notice for whatever the situation is. No, I would say for me, you know, some of that, that fear came from seeing other people who were experts who had failed, right? Mm. These people that you believe have it all together. They have their lives together. Maybe you see them speak on stage and you get a chance to hear and see how they're doing. And you're like, oh my gosh, this person's amazing. The next thing you know, they failed, right? Or you look at companies like I'm in the capital raising business to a certain extent and companies that raise a hundred million dollars that are out of business or a recent one, Andrew Grassio raised three billion dollars and they're applying for bankruptcy within a few years. Like, man, if these really, really smart, wicked smart people who know what they're doing, who are the experts in their field are still failing, what chance do I have? Right. And I think that's a belief that holds a lot of people back. Right. But the thing that people don't remember is that no expert ever got there without the scars, the broken bones, the bloody noses, right? Mm. Michael Jordan got cut from his high school basketball team, right? You know, these people that we put on this pedestal had to go through that same process, right? Some of them tried to take a shortcut and leapfrog, and those are the ones we see that didn't get the principles along the way, and as a result, they might have gotten, you know, a flash-in-the-pan success, but then they fall off the radar. And you can see this in any any career, any industry, whether it's arts and entertainment, athletes, business, doesn't matter. No, absolutely. And, you know, it is, and I will obviously come on to talk about that later, it, you know, it is a necessary kind of part of the entrepreneurial um, journey. And do you think that fear of failure led you to the military in some ways? Because it's a, yeah, it's a kind of, you know safe safer environment when it's you know you well can you fail in 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 the military in in a way because i'm just i'm just trying to see if there was any influence i suppose from that 
that experience of seeing your dad and the difficulties and challenges he went through and how that maybe influenced your early career decisions? Yeah, so I'd say I was like a ship without a rudder when I was in high school. All I wanted to do was play baseball. That was it. Um, I ended up ruining my arm playing baseball and then football and couldn't play anymore. I was like, you know, it wasn't going to be, you know, the next Sandy Koufax pitching on the mound, right? So for me, I was rudderless. And the idea of starting my own business when I was in high school, I was like, yeah, that's, I'm not going to do that. And because I came from this very poor background and a poor mentality, um, I wasn't thinking I could get the money I needed to go to college and do all that, nor did I want to. I didn't want to go into debt. I didn't want to have that. So it kind of limited my options down to, okay, well, you know, you can go on a sabbatical, you can travel the world, but with what money? And I wasn't, um, uh, resourceful enough back then to figure that out, uh, nor had that even really crossed my mind. I just knew I wanted to get out of my little town that I was in in Colorado at the time and go see the world. And so this guy showed up and said, hey, you know, you put a uniform, you're going to go see the world, we're going to pay you to do it. There's a whole bunch of pretty girls around the world that, that would love to see in the uniform. So, okay, I'm sold. Right? Mm-hmm. So uh, what drove me in that direction, I didn't have a fear of the military at all. My, I had three grandfathers, all in the military, um, you know, and so there was that background to a certain extent, but you can absolutely fail in the military because the expectations are incredibly high. Now, there are certain fields within the military, the expectations are not that high, but the discipline, the attention to detail, everywhere you go in the military, that that is pretty high. And so um, I gravitated towards that because again, like I was saying earlier, I like doing the thing. And so if I can learn, I can implement, then you know, I can make that work. And that's what happened in the military. Was there any, uh, ever any encouragement from your, um, your dad to follow his path into entrepreneurship? No. Um, yeah, my parents were very much a, you know, all right, well, if this is what you want to do, we'll support you, but we're not going to force anything upon you. Um, I helped my dad. I worked with my dad when I was a teenager, going to jobs and doing jobs with him, but there was never any pressure for me to join him in the family business. Right. So were they supportive of your decision to go into the military? They were definitely taken off guard by that one. <laughs> um, I made the decision when I was 17. And I remember they had to have some conversations with the recruiters and learn more about this. And, you know, of course, my mom was worried at that point. You know, we're on the, the tail end of the uh, the Gulf War, as we call it here. And this is pre-9-11 and all of that. So there wasn't as much apprehension as there probably would have been shortly after that. But mm. yeah, they weren't opposed, but they wanted to make sure I went in with my eyes open as to what it might entail. And I'm I'm struck by a word you used earlier, which was in, you know you were embarrassed by your situation that you know you said you were living in a in a trailer. How long were you living in that trailer, and what impact did that kind of embarrassment have on your kind of childhood? Yeah. Uh... You know, that's one of those things that I compartmentalized for so long that I didn't really pay attention to it. It was it was a few months that we were in that. We were living in other people's houses and then we were living in other people's trailers. We were doing all this stuff. And it was just like it was it was kind of miserable. We had one at one point we had to get into a motel, uh, just so we had a place to stay. And, you know, when you're a teenager, you don't I wasn't even I was like I said, twelve, thirteen years old. I didn't know anything that my parents were going through. And looking back now, being an adult, being a father, I realized they must have been going through such tremendous heartache and hardship their own, on the, their own that I have no animosity towards them. I'm not upset about it. Um, at the time, it was embarrassing because we couldn't afford clothes unless it came from a secondhand store. I still remember Miser's Mercantile in the town and having to go buy like the ugliest things you wear and the kids would make fun of you because you're wearing the stupidest looking winter coat in the mountains and you know, that, that style went out in the eighties. It's like, well, you know, we're not too far from that, but kids are mean. Right. Mm, um, so, you know, it, it, I think that probably made me want to propel and push harder so I could be better than, than them. I wasn't witty. I couldn't come up with comebacks. I wasn't hilarious. I wasn't, wasn't the funny guy in the room. I wasn't the most attractive. I wasn't the strongest. I wasn't the tallest. I wasn't anything. So if I couldn't be any of that, I was damn sure going to outwork you. I mean, it, but it still sounds, a, you know, a really, um, yeah, kind of 
tough, tough period for you. And did that affect your kind of schooling at all and your grades? No, no, school was easy for me. Um, I, school was kind of a joke in, in all reality. You know, you, you learn stuff, but the the public education and how every education system teach us to the practically the lowest common denominator. Mm -hmm. And I'm a sponge when it comes to information. So if there's something I want to learn, I'll suck it up really quickly. But when you're going at the pace of the slowest person in the room, it's not very hard to keep pace with it. And it sounds so it sounds like you've always had a a thirst for learning then. Yeah, I'd say so. Um I remember we used to have actual encyclopedias and then we finally got Encyclopedia Britannica on a CD and Encarta. I remember that. For anybody that remembers Microsoft <laughs> Encarta, that was just like game changing. All this information available at your fingertips on a CD-ROM and it only took you about 10 minutes to boot it up, right? Um, so, yeah, it, I don't know where that comes from. Um, I think it probably comes from my dad and my grandfather's telling stories. And when somebody is good at telling a good story and captivating and engaging you, you get drawn in and you're like, oh, I want to know more and tell me more about that thing, right? So I think that's probably where it comes from. So fast forwarding then, what, what would you say was the first success or, yeah, pivotal moment that you had in your business and entrepreneurial career? I mean, I guess the first one would be the very first property I bought. Um, that was an initial success because I essentially lived uh, rent-free, mortgage-free for over a year. Because I bought a property and then I rented out rooms to my buddies and they paid my mortgage and it was great. So that was my first taste of, hey, I can actually make money just using my brain and yeah, figuring out some strategies. And I was still in the Navy at the time. So life was pretty good at that point. And then away from real estate, what did that first you know, business look like that you set up? So yeah, outside of real estate, I struggled big time. Um, you know, financial planning. Gosh, I was terrible at that because I didn't believe in it. I didn't believe in what I was teaching people or telling people or doing with them. And the, the you're a salesperson. And I was like, I'm not a salesperson. It's not what I want to do. And I'm trying to teach somebody something that I don't really think is accurate or correct. And I look at all the rich people in the world. They're not doing this. So why should I be teaching this to people? Um, so, you know, being a financial planner was absolutely terrible. Being, you know, the, the first... The first cool thing for me, I'll, I'll, I'll give you this. Before I left corporate, before I knew what I wanted to do, I went to this event and I'm not speaking at an event at this point. I was actually at an event to learn how to speak and to learn how to get on stages and learn how to give a great presentation. And the speaker did a really cool thing. Dave, Dave Van Hoos, I'll never forget him. I uh, did this really cool thing. He goes, hey, so, you know, we want to give you guys and everybody in the room has an area of expertise. We're going to give each of you like 30 seconds if you want to to stand up and give one piece of advice to everybody in this room that you think they could really benefit from. And I got up and I gave my one, one little bit of advice, which was, you know, if, if you ever want to succeed in anything in business, you got to find a way to systemize it and streamline. So you're not the one doing all the work. And I had this guy who came up to me at one of the breaks and said, Hey, I heard what you said. Here's the thing. I've been running my, my mobile home buying business for a long time and I'm trying to not work as hard. I can't figure it out. Can you, you know, do you do consulting? <laughs> Never really even thought about it at that point. I was like, oh, yeah, absolutely. I'll do that. Right. And so I go, well, how much would it be? And I just blurted out a number that was like, oh, $15,000. I said, oh, okay. Well, for how long? I said, three months. And, you know, that was less than what I was making in my job at that point. So I still felt pretty comfortable with that number. He said, okay, cool. When can we start? <laughs> you know, wow. it was like that just because it's I'd gotten either. It, it was, it was, it really was. And, I mean, of course, we had a conversation leading up to that point, but, you know, it was pretty straightforward. I, I walked away with a uh, potential sale. I just had to find a way to collect the money at that point. <laughs> so, <laughs> which that's an easy problem to figure out once you've got a yes. So did that consulting business lead on to anything? Like, did you pick up many more clients? You know, I became so disenfranchised with this consulting so quickly because what I realized you know, at this point, you know, this was seven, eight years ago, give or take now. Mm -hmm. um, in the corporate world, I was helping companies raise capital. I was helping streamline businesses. I was working with billion plus dollar entities. And when you're working with these really, really big companies and you give them advice and you tell them what they should be doing and you so you show them 
you know, how we think it'll work, either they have a choice. They can either say, yes, I like that, and they implement it, which is great, or no, we don't agree with that. We're going to go a different direction, which is also fine. At least they gave you a no. When I started consulting, I started working with small business owners who loved everything I had to say. Not a single one of them was ever upset with the level of service I gave them, but they would never implement it. And they wouldn't implement it because it was too hard. And they didn't have the team or they didn't have the capital or they didn't have the bandwidth or whatever it was. I was like, gosh, this is, I feel like I'm just banging my head against the wall. I'm, you guys love what I'm saying. You're doing, and I had a few people that were successful doing, with what I gave them. But, you know, most of them, they just wouldn't implement. And I said, okay, this is not really for me. You know, I, I don't like feeling like I'm wasting my time with people. It's great that they're paying me, but if you're not going to use what I give you, then why are we even doing this? Yeah, I mean, that sounds incredibly kind of frustrating that because essentially you've not got control there right you can suggest and coach those people and mentor those people yeah to find or to i suppose know the the right path but ultimately it's about them it actually delivering on it yeah well that's that's been a challenge of my life really as a consultant or advisor is that I can only work with a certain subset of any entrepreneur or CEO. And I figured this out along the way because I operate at such a level that, not to sound arrogant, but I know my stuff really, really well. I don't talk on anything I'm not good at. Mm -hmm. If I'm not good at it, I'll either go learn it or I'll let somebody else handle it. But mm -hmm. if somebody hires me, they're going to hire me for the thing that I'm really good at. And the things that I'm good at, when I give them the information about it, then... I want them to implement it because the people that don't implement it, they come back and say, well, you told us all this stuff to do, but it doesn't really work. I say, well, did you do it? Mm. Well, yeah, we tried it. Well, how much of it did you try? Like, you know, cause I'm looking at it right now and I don't even see, you know, step three being completed on this list of 25 steps. So you've only got the step two. Like, well, yeah, that's cause it, it takes too much time. Well, you know what? Rome wasn't built in a day either. So, yeah. you know, we either got to figure this out and move forward or we're done. And it turns out that there's only so many people that I can work with before my patients will wear thin with them. And if they don't have the gumption to, uh, you know, stick in there and realize that what I'm telling them, even though it hurts, it's painful, and it might be uh, somewhat condescending at times, it's the truth, right? And yeah, you know, I'll give me give me plenty of examples, but you know, we had a client where I was able to get them over six figures a month. I was selling their product and I showed them what we did and said, okay, so now we need to ramp up our budget. No, 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 no. We're not sure that's where all the money came from. Okay, well, I guess we can turn off the flow of money if you want to and <laughs> just see what happens. And it just tanked like 80% lower revenue right. the next month. And well, that was probably because it was a sale or it was probably because this person was helping us promote. It's like the data doesn't lie. So you know what? If you're not going to do it, we're not going to do this. Do you think there is a some kind of pattern or commonality between those people that you work with that don't implement? Yeah, I mean, most of the time it's a failing on my part, to be quite honest. I take on clients that I want to help, that I believe in, that I, I love their product, I love their their technology, I love what they're doing, but they're not ready for me. And there's a, a big challenge to that because I'll get equity in companies. I can do consulting for equity. I can, you know, I, I sometimes even take over companies by consulting with them and advising, and then. We bring in the capital later if we need it. But if a company's not ready for me, then there's only so much they can do because the entrepreneur, the CEO, the founder, it doesn't really matter who it is. They are not at the level that they need to be at to implement. And, you know, I, I struggle with this. I tell this to some of my friends, like sometimes you have to tell people who think they're really good at what they do that they're not. And a lot of people can't handle that. Right. And they, you don't want to say, okay, you actually suck at the thing you're doing. You actually need to position a little bit softer than that, you know, be, be constructive, not just be demeaning. But they don't know how to overcome that because everyone around them tells them that they're so great at this thing. But I've been around so many people that in virtue of, of what I do that I know when somebody is not good enough. And when they're not good enough, but everybody tells them that they are great throughout their entire lives, they really struggle to reconcile that and realize that maybe they should hire somebody else or have somebody else do the thing. Instead, they just try to get better at it. And when they try to get better at it, they fail ultimately because it's not the thing they should be doing. 
what are the early signs of that? What are the the kind of the the red flags that you see amongst those people that you think, oh, actually, no, this isn't the person I thought they were, or I oh, actually I shouldn't be working with them. Yes, yeah, it's, it's pretty straightforward. You give them tasks, the things that they need to do or work on, and they come back meeting after meeting, not having gotten anything done, and complaining why things are not working out. It's like, well, you know, did you get the things done that we know is gonna are gonna help? And if the answer is no, then why are you complaining? You know, um, mm-hmm. on the other hand, if somebody says, yeah, we did this, we did this, we did this, we tried it, we can say, okay, great. Like in marketing, we do marketing and advertising all the time. And any marketer who is worth their salt will tell you, you split test everything. And I, as a marketer, and I do copywriting and I work with our graphics team and I work with our video team, like advertising and marketing is a multifaceted, multi-skilled endeavor. You can't, I can't do it all, right? And so I've gotten really good at seeing the process through and the strategy, but even still, I I don't know, and I can't say with certainty that any one advertisement will work, any one landing page will work, any one copywriting headline, subject line, any of that stuff will work. So we test and we put as much stuff out there. And the people who are not even willing to test, but are going to go full headed in one direction, and then not even acknowledge the signs when they're coming through, that's not a good client for me. And the person says, well, I can't afford to test. It's also not a good client, right? Because, you know, you can't afford to test today. You're going to be able to afford a lot less tomorrow. Do you think it, some of this is uh, is mindset as well as capability? 100%. Um, I'd say it's 95% mindset, right? Yeah. Uh, skills can be outsourced, right? Experience cannot. So... The people who are successful with me know full well that they can't do everything and they embrace that. They acknowledge that. They're actually really happy about that because those same people are good at finding the person who can do the thing Mm. because they quickly and readily acknowledge this is not the thing I should be doing. But if you're telling me like they have to have, I hope this doesn't offend too many people. I know it will. But you have to have a certain level of ineptitude to succeed, right? You have to be ignorant of a lot of things to succeed. And you have to be willing to acknowledge that ignorance. Because if you are not willing to acknowledge the fact that you are ignorant in certain areas and instead try to take on too much, you will not succeed because we all only have a certain number of hours a day. But I mean, like I said, I hope it doesn't offend too many people. But if you're not offended by that, then you're on the right track. I think that's an interesting kind of comment as because entrepreneurs, when they're starting off, tend to do everything. So I, I think therefore they feel that they're they're all rounders, they're generalists, they can do a bit of finance, a bit of marketing, some operations. But what you've just said is is actually they can't and they should recognize what they can't do and then outsource it. What would you what would you say to that? I'd say that you're, you're right on both accounts, right? If you don't have any money, right? You weren't born to a rich family. No one's giving you a loan to go start your business. You don't have tons of savings. Then yeah, you have to be resourceful at day one. And the more resourceful you are, the better off you will be. Right? And so sometimes being resourceful means bootstrapping as much as you can, doing everything, learning everything and all that. I saw a tweet from someone I follow recently, and I thought it was very spot on, which is your goal as the founder slash CEO is to find a way to replace yourself every three months. Mm. And most people wouldn't understand what that means. But if I said, okay, when you start out a business, what's your job? Like number one job for any entrepreneur, I don't really care what business it is, what industry it is, it's sales, it's revenue, it's revenue generation, right? Um, for some people that say, oh, well, we need to get to R&D done or prototyping done so we can, no, no, you got to go out there and find a way to get the money in the door. Because without money coming in, unless you're going to live in your mom's basement for the rest of your life and have her cook your your mac and cheese for you, you got to have a way to survive, right? Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So we got to at least get that baseline taken care of. So sure, start out sleeping on the friend's couch, start out sleeping in the, in the basement, doesn't really matter. But if you ever want to grow, you got to get money coming in the door. So in, in my world, a lot of the time, that's by going out there and finding investors and raising capital. You cannot raise capital if you only have an idea with no action, right? 
because an idea without any action is just a dream. So we need to instead create action and traction. That gets you the money in the door. So the number one job of every entrepreneur, get the money in the door. So once you've figured out how to do that and you start getting a little money in the door, or if you can convince other people that you think would be great to have long-term, you give them options in your company so you don't even have to give them money. Now you find a way to say, okay, I go, Jez, if I said, hey, you've got to go out there and you got to generate the sales, you got to talk to the investors, you got to handle the account, you got to do the bookkeeping, you got to set up the marketing, go by the way, build a website, make sure you get your branding taken care of and your mood board set up and, oh, you have like 15 different social media accounts and you get going, plus we need to do email marketing. So like, it's overwhelming, right? It's too much stuff. Now you could probably do all that stuff, but it's going to take you a long time. If you want to succeed, you got to shorten the window between, you know, idea and implementation. And the only way you do that is by building a team. So to answer your question in a roundabout way, we all start off with all these ideas and all these different things where 17 different hats that we're wearing, but you need to find a way to start taking those hats off and putting them on competent people as quickly as you possibly can. And so if your goal is to scale and grow, you've got to figure out how to do that fast. So look at what you can outsource at least every three months, change your job, job description. Um, another friend of mine said, you know, what I do is I went out there and I said, I need to find a CEO. So I wrote a job description for the CEO of my company and I put down everything the CEO needs to be able to do. And then I made that my job. So I, I fired myself and I hired myself and I only did the things that were on that, that job description, everything else I had to find somebody else for. It's another great uh, way to go about it. No, no that's a, that's a great tip. Yeah, I mean, I was just thinking um, one of my favorite business books is The E-Myth, and that's exactly what he talks about uh, in that, isn't it? Essentially uh, finding other people to take up all of the different roles um, yep. in, in the business and, and you moving on to other other roles up the kind of hierarchy. So looking at your journey, what would you say has been the biggest and the most significant business failure that you've encountered? Well, the, yeah, uh, being a person who has helped raise angel money and, and invested in companies and helped other people raise company capital, I've seen lots of failures. I've been, been privy to some of them. I've seen people get swindled and taken advantage of, but I will say that the biggest failure that I've gone through was me personally in 2018, my business partner and I, uh, we we're building out, we had, an e-commerce platform built on WordPress and it was a nightmare. And so we said, okay, well, we need to go build our own. This is ridiculous. We're still building it. We're, you know, it's going to be a great company in the very near future. But it was one of those situations like we've got to get off of this. And if we're going to build our own platform, we got to learn all the pain points for this industry we're going into in e-commerce. And so we had, we ended up setting up Shopify stores. We started getting in with a, a few people that were good at helping us drive traffic and helping us do all this stuff. So we said, all right, they've got the connections and they had connections to uh, manufacturers. It's like, cool. We're going to take those manufacturers that normally only sell wholesale and we're going to go direct to consumer with them. That was going to be our business model, direct to consumer e-commerce. And we did that. And we went to the manufacturers and we started getting these products and we started running ads and we found out which, which ads worked and which products would sell. And we would do this really quickly. We must've tested over 500 products. And as we're testing these products, remember the manufacturers making them, they're building them. We're just selling them. It's called drop shipping. So we would sell them, they would ship them. That was the whole model. All we had to do was manage the finances. So all the money back and forth, the advertising, all the logistics to get the order to them, they would handle the logistics of delivering to the customer. We thought, okay, we'll scale this up and we'll see how everything goes. And you know, we'll put a little bit of money behind it. Within the first 30 days, we've made a million dollars. So we scaled up quickly. By the end of the eighth month, we were doing $3 million a month and, wow. you know, constantly just looking for new products and scaling. And of course, along the way, you're learning every little in and out of this business, right? Everything from supply chain management, to vendor relations, to international um, customs issues that you have to deal with, VAT, tax, and on and on and on. And my job was the finance, right? So I was the go-between from operations and finance over to the, the sales and marketing. And I was on the phone every morning, I kid you not, with American Express and Chase Bank, because on their app, I was wiring money from uh, Chase to American Express to pay for the advertising that we were running online, because we were doing 100000 to $150,000 per day running advertising. 
And we were doing that using an American Express because, well, you could get the points and it was amazing. So, you know, it, it also gives you a lot of headaches because once you get to that limit, they just turn the card off. And it's like, okay, if we're doing $100,000 in, in advertising, we got to make sure there's room on the card. So I had a stack, you know, like 20 different credit cards and we were just making sure all of them were getting paid off. So that was my job. So I was on the phone, you know, connecting in Chase and American Express because they needed to verify their funds in the bank and transfer that over. Yep, it's happening. It's great. And this was great. And we're like, okay, cool. We need to go. And we were just drop shipping at that point. So now we wanted to scale. We say, okay, we want to take this. We actually want to turn it into a real brand and a real business. We found these products for people like these are all housewares and home lifestyle kind of products. And so, all right, let's turn this into a brand. So let's go meet with the manufacturers. Let's go set this up. Like, uh, let's actually build a brand around this, not just sell somebody else's cheesy products. And about that same time, we started getting returns. So we would get these pillows shipped back to us that we were kind of like the MyPillow thing and sort of a MyPillow knockoff that had like no filling inside the pillows. And then we would get these uh, mirrors returned to us that didn't work at all. Okay, so there's some quality assurance. We got to go fix this. And then one day I wake up as we're planning our trip and getting this all going to go meet the manufacturer. Um, I get a $500,000 wire to my account. And then I get another $500,000 the next day into our account. I call up my business partner. I was like, hey, where'd this money come from? He goes, what money? I say, you didn't see it? He looks, he goes, oh, crap. Where is that? What is it going on? So it took us like a day. By the time all was said and done, we'd gotten about $2 million put back into our account. Most people would be really excited about that, right? A couple million bucks coming in. <laughs> These were refunds from our manufacturer who said that he could not fulfill all the products that we had sold. I'm like, wait a minute, guy. <laughs> what do you we've we've sold this because you said you could fulfill this and now you're not sending stuff out? What are you talking about? This is ridiculous. At the same time, we start getting refund requests and chargebacks. And because we're in drop shipping, we knew how to handle this because drop shipping is, you know, you generally buy something and you have to wait four or five, six weeks to get it. It's not like Amazon overnight delivery or get it the same day it's like you're waiting a while but now we're starting to get all these refunds we're like well this doesn't make sense we just heard about this today what do you why are we getting refunds all of a sudden well for about six to eight weeks they were shipping shipping empty boxes because they could not fulfill so not only did we outsell our manufacturers capabilities but this gentleman told us that he just simply couldn't keep up so to prevent us from turning off the flow of funds to him he just starts shipping out empty stuff. So it would look like on the, the tracking side of things that if you got a tracking number, we knew it got shipped in and went out the door. Okay, cool. We we'll checked that box. It wasn't happening. Just an empty box. And people start complaining. You start getting chargebacks. So we went through this situation where we ended up having to refund about 50,000 people. Um, luckily, there were a number of people that didn't ask for or need a refund or understood our situation because the money ran out really quickly. PayPal shut our accounts down. Chase shut our accounts down. American Express turned everything off. Our merchant processors turned everything off. Like we were blacklisted. We could not do business anywhere online. Um, There's no loans we could get to cover this loss because the money had stopped flowing in. So they couldn't see any of this. And they're like, yeah, if you don't have a merchant account, we can't give you a loan. Like this is not happening. Um, and we had loans, so, you know, because when you're doing that much revenue, money just comes to you. Right. Like when you're making money, hand over fist, money comes to you and it's cheap. Right. So Shopify Capital, PayPal Capital, you know, the American Express had no limit on it anymore. It was just it was it was phenomenal while it was working. When it wasn't working, it, it was kind of like parachuting down and having the cords cut on the parachute. Right. Just free fall. And so within 45 days of us doing about three million dollars in, in revenue in one month, we were out of business, damn near bankrupt. Um you know, and, and everything was just completely shut down, lost the team. We had over 50 people working for us at that point. And it was a hard, hard lesson learned to say the least. I mean, that's such a, <laughs> I mean, there's so much John Pack there, but that's, that, that is some roller coaster. what, eight, nine months, did you say? Mm -hmm. Yeah. From November of 18 to July of 19, we had done 17 million in sales. And then uh, at the end of the next month, they all by August, all the bank accounts were empty. Everything was shut down. The re we had, while we could afford it, we had forty people doing refunds twenty four seven. Oh my god! So, d did you have enough funds to do all those refunds? Nope, we sure didn't. Um, no, we had to deal with lawsuits from PayPal. I have a screenshot somewhere, and um, I share this with people from time to time when I say, "Okay, you think you guys are having a bad day?" 
um, you think your business is doing bad, look at this. And I pull it up. It's like $916,000 in the red for PayPal. That's what we owed them. Oh my God. Because PayPal would issue the refunds if people, internationally people pay through PayPal a lot. So PayPal issued the refunds, but then they came back to us and say, okay, well, we'll do what we can, but yeah, we have to deal with lawsuits and all sorts of stuff. And, and, you know, some of that stuff is actually still ongoing years later, but um, yeah, definitely not fun. So how did you manage to settle those law? I mean, where did you get the funds when you had lawsuits, for example, where did you get the funds or did you just declare kind of bankruptcy and then obviously get the sort of loans and debts wiped out? No, didn't declare bankruptcy. Um, there were lots of things that we had to negotiate with people and we're scrappy. So we kept the other, we had other businesses going. So it's sort of like you now robbing Peter to pay Paul to keep the doors open, keep the lights on. Um, certain other businesses ended up taking a big hit and we had, we also managed e-commerce stores for, uh, for celebrities and influencers and things like that. So we're still getting money coming in from other avenues to help pay some of this stuff. But no, that business essentially went belly up and we had to go through lawsuits and, um, and deal with the attorneys and things like that. And just to, I suppose, give the listeners an understanding of the volume, cause you must be doing volume, right? Cause how, what was the average cost of sale? We had 400,000 customers, 400,000 credit cards on file through our process uh, in that period of time. And the average order value is about $35. So, so that, and that's one of the reasons I suppose is that your manufacturer couldn't cope because it was such large volume. It was, yeah. And, and that's, that was a, a really big failing on our part, right? We trusted people, but we didn't verify it. And whenever you go to a manufacturer, you look at what the lead time is, you look at what the MOQ is, the minimum order quantity, you need to figure out what their raw material um, supply chain looks like. How many months of supply do they have available? What's sitting there on the docks right now? You know, and we trusted that they had this stuff, but, and, and they said, yeah, yeah, we can go up to X number of units per month. And I don't remember what that number was. No problem. Well, we were working with um, some Chinese manufacturers and there's also some cultural issues that I learned along the way, which is that in a lot of these manufacturing world, we have, we, and I, I knew about this. This was an easy part with subcontracting, right? If if you have an outage or you go down, you generally have a relationship with another manufacturer or somebody who can pick up, and then you will pay them, you know, a little bit of the profit that you would normally make, right? So they get covered completely, and and they're happy to do it. Turns out, when you snub somebody in certain cultures, uh, they do what they can to prevent you from being able to subcontract out. And in this case, this guy had taken over a massive amount of business from these other people that he normally would have subcontracted to because he was getting the orders from us. And he said, oh, yeah, I can handle that. You don't need to go to that. Just come to me. So we did that. Well, that shut down those avenues to other contract, other manufacturers when he got to a point where he couldn't fulfill anymore. So even though there was a potential for us to be able to save it because of the cultural issues, it wasn't going to happen. So he got greedy. He got greedy. Um, I think I think there were some people greasing their palms along the way, right? And, you know, because we, we knew what our costs were on our end, and we didn't own the manufacturing and the supply chain. We just knew what our costs were to buy things wholesale, and we were okay with that. But there were definitely some some greedy folks along the way that I think caused some, some infighting that prevented us from being able to fix and remedy the situation when it did happen. How many manufacturers were you working with? Uh, we had four different manufacturers that we had contracted different things out to. So we didn't have just one, but the, we had one that was the main one that had multiple supply lines. And so, you know, we, anybody that knows anything about manufacturing, when you have a single product or a couple of products and they just need molds and things like that, and they can wrap it up if they have the materials, you know, they turn things out pretty quickly, right? So you don't need a number of different places because then you're dealing with quality control issues as well. But yeah, it, it was an issue because uh, one upset the other three and the other three wouldn't come to our rescue when we needed them. All right. So what, in terms of those partners, cause obviously they were key partners to your business. What would you have done differently? Yeah, we would have implemented a um, quality control system from the very get go, quite honestly, because when you're 
when you're not in control of the quality of your product, you are in big trouble. If you are relying on that product to speak for itself, uh, one of my business partners says nothing sells product better than product. And that's true when you have a great product, right? It'll speak for itself. People will refer to you. They'll want other people to buy it. They'll tell everybody how great it is. When it's terrible, the same thing is true, right? And they'll tell everybody to avoid it at all costs. And so you got to make sure that you have a quality product going out the door. Like that's, I, I tell people, I, I can't fix the economics of a business. I can't fix the operations of a business if the quality of what you're trying to sell or deliver is terrible, right? There's, there's no fix. I can't fix that. They have to fix that part. But if they can, if they have a good quality product, then everything else is fixable. And how much due diligence did you do on these manufacturers that you're working with? We had partners that we trusted. And so um, they had given us their work, right? And that's the whole thing. Trust, but verify, right? We didn't verify. And these people we were working with, who we were also paying, who were part of the owners in the business, were like, well, they have a vested interest in this thing succeeding. So why would they lie, right? And yeah, that was obviously a failure on our part. What was the kind of lowest point of that that period? I uh, also went through a divorce <laughs> at the same time. At the same time? Um, yeah, same time. So when this business kind of started picking up, I quit my corporate gig and left that to go be a full-time entrepreneur. My, my wife at the time had her chiropractic business, and we'd gotten that to the point over the course of a few years where it could cover our incomes. And so this gave me the the cushion to be able to go out there and do this. And then this took off really quickly. But in that process, it was like, no, the, this marriage is over. So yeah, I ended up going through a divorce, um, having to leave my house, move into an apartment, deal with a lot of other you know, personal issues along the way. But yeah, that was, uh, I'd say the, the lowest point for me was on Memorial Day weekend when I had to move out as pouring down rain. And I, I was leaving my own house. And at that point, the, the business was actually doing really well, um, still up until that point, but the, you know, the, the, the chinks in the armor were starting to show at that point. And Memorial Day for those international listeners here in the United States, that's the end of May. So the end of May of 2019 is kind of when we started seeing some of those, those returns coming in. And it was also when I was moving out of my house and dealing with all this stuff. So that was a little bit challenging by July that's when we had a, a full on tsunami of problems. And so I'd say, you know, July of 2019 was pretty rough for me. And to take us back, what did that kind of, you know, feel like? How did you navigate that and get, kind of get through it? Yeah. Well, um, at that time, I was definitely drinking a lot more whiskey than I probably ever should have. <laughs> that's for sure. Um, you know, I'm a very optimistic person most of the time. I, again, I'm very optimistic until all of a sudden everything comes to a, a screeching halt and then you get, I wouldn't say I got worried or anxious about that, but I got mad, just really, really mad. So I was going to the gym, I was working out, I was traveling still because you know, I still, at that point, I still had my savings and my money, which was good. But yeah, you get to this point where you just feel like, yeah, oh, man, all hope is lost and this is miserable. What am I going to do? And, you know, kind of this pity party. Uh, one thing that I learned about myself over the years is that I don't do that very well. I, I don't like feeling sorry for myself. I actually hate that feeling. So I will pour myself back into some other project or get something else going. Unfortunately, when you are in that kind of state where you're watching, you know, the building crumble down around you, you don't generally make the best decisions, right? You, you're in this fight or flight mode. You are dealing with crisis. It's essentially crisis management. But it's not like somebody else's crisis where you're helping somebody else and you can feel good about what you're doing while in the process. Instead, you're like, I've got to fix this. I don't know how to fix it. You know, I don't know how to fix this because this is something that, you know, they don't, they don't train you for this in your MBA, right? Mm -hmm. They don't train you for this in anything unless you're, you know, that maybe that attorney that's going through and dealing with bankruptcies and business shutdowns and things like that. But when it's your own, I'd imagine it's still different for them too. So for me, it was... It was shielding my my real true emotions from the rest of the world, right? Not letting the rest of the world see how frustrated and upset I was. Because when you are, you know, still the boss, I was still in charge of people, I still have my other businesses, and I couldn't let on that everything was miserable, right, in my personal life. So you compartmentalize, and I'm pretty good at that. But you do have to have this release of emotions at some point. And you have to get it out of your system and you have to realize that life will go on. And, you know, it's hard to let a lot of that stuff go. 
um, you know, especially when you're mixing in, you know, business failure, lack of money and a divorce at the same time. And, you know, this house, this entire life that you've built up in your mind is disappearing. That's a lot to take in. Right. And so luckily for me, I ended up meeting my, my current wife in uh, March of 2020. Thank goodness. Right before COVID shut everything down. Um, and that was what got me back on track, right? Having, having her in my life, because we could go through some of this stuff together. Um, we started dating and you know, like I said, COVID shut everything down, but I finally found somebody who I could confide in and I could talk to. So I talked to, you know, I went to therapy and talked to, to people about certain things just so I didn't go off the deep end. Um, I had two kids, right? You know, you can't, you can't just, uh, leave with them. Now, and you can't ignore them. You can't ignore the fact that at the time they're five and six, five and seven years old, you know, they, they still needed their dad. And so I had to be there for that. So I had to suck it up and suck at whatever I was feeling dealing. I definitely was not the best father of the year at that time, but you know, we made it through and eventually got back on track. Did all of, all of that with the business sort of collapsing so suddenly and then your divorce did that? knock your confidence yeah absolutely um you know I, I think if it doesn't then you know you might be sociopathic quite honestly <laughs> if uh if those types of things don't don't knock you down a, a rung or two and that is that's a really challenging situation to be in right when this thing that you were building your life upon completely disappears you know, anybody starts questioning that, right? I saw this really great video the other day and it was talking about, you know, things that are hard and the opposites are true as well, which was, you know, one example was marriage is hard, but getting divorced is harder. Choose your heart, right? Choose the, choose the hard route you want to take. And for me, um, going through the divorce is the right thing, right? And a lot of people say you don't do that if you have kids. Well, if you're not going to be the role model you want your kids to be around, then and it's because of a relationship, you probably should not be in that relationship. And I, I definitely tried to fix the relationship, so I don't want to make people think that I just like walked out the door. But this was a situation that we'd been trying to resolve, and it wasn't. So walking out the door was the right thing to do. And my only requirement was I keep my truck, I keep my businesses, and I keep my kids, right? So I still got to see my kids, and that was really important to me. Um but little did I know how much all that other stuff was going to affect me. You know, it's one thing to go through a divorce and to have to move out and move on if you're making a lot of money, right? If you're making money hand over fist, which I was for a short little stint there, you know, while we're separated and moving out, I was still making good money. I could, I could cope with that. I could handle that. I could deal with that, right? When the money stops coming in and the business goes away as well, and you kind of go back to the survival mode, it was almost like me going back to that 12-year-old kid that was in the house with my, my, or not house, but a trailer or a motel with my parents. I'm like, what in the world is going on? I swore I'd never be here. How in the world is this happening? And so you start exploring, you know, whether it's spiritual for some people, for me, it was very much a, a journey of introspection uh, and reflection, trying to figure things out. But it, it definitely takes its toll. And anybody who says that it doesn't knock your confidence down would be lying. Did you at that point start to, maybe tell yourself stories around and reflect back into that maybe this is a mirror image of you know some of the struggles your dad had went through around entrepreneurship did you start to doubt whether entrepreneurship was was kind of right for you did you start to think start to go back to those stories that you were telling yourself at you know 12 or 13 so, yeah, of course, you know, I started thinking about that. It, and here's the thing, it wasn't ever a question of whether I should be an entrepreneur or not. It, it was a question of, do I have what it takes to see myself through this and to come out the other side successful? And the answer to that was, yes, I have what it takes. I know I do. I have been through far harder, worse situations. I've been through, you know, life endangering situations. Um, so... This was one of those situations, all I had to do, and I know it sounds trite to say it this way, but all I had to do was, for, was realize that money is not an issue, right? Money is, money is not the end all be all. I'd survived through this before. I've survived through less money before. I've survived through heartache. I've survived through 
all of this stuff before is just realizing that it takes time. And I don't think people give enough credence to that, right? That you can overcome any tragedy in your life as long as you continue to live if you give it enough time, right? Um, you know, the, the death of a loved one, the death of a friend that, you know, I've had friends that have passed on. I've had, you know, family members very close to me pass on. I've had, but, you know, I, uh, obviously the death of a child would be the absolute worst. It'd be devastating. But if you can continue putting one foot in front of the other and you can give yourself enough time and distance and grace as well to experience all that, then you will be able to move forward. Um, as guys, we get this, uh, rap for you know hiding our feelings from everybody else and not talking about them and a lot of the time that's because people are scared to hear what you actually have to say right um you know they they don't want to admit that but if you were to tell a loved one how you really feel right they might want to lock you up right like when when i had people steal from me because i also ended up going through a business partnership that failed and got stabbed in the back on that one and people left me and um, yeah, you, you don't have nice, kind thoughts for a while, right? It's not like you, I'm not Gandhi here. I can't just easily forgive, you know, I'm not Buddha. I can't just like walk away and, you know, it's, it's, it's all good. I'm not quite at that Zen state. So you, you deal with things, you internalize them because you're afraid of pushing too many people too far away to where they won't come back. And that is dangerous for everybody involved, right? Because you can become a ticking time bomb if you don't find an outlet. And I'd, I'd suggest that anybody that has to go through that, they find some sort of outlet and they acknowledge it, right? Like you can't just hide away from it and expect it and pretend like it didn't happen. It will catch up to you. But you still have to give yourself that time and that space to you know, really acknowledge and feel what you feel and go through it in your own way, whatever that is. Yeah, it's kind of, you have to go on that journey, don't you? One thing I, I wanted to sort of like ask about was was just sort of how you know you and you kind of talked about it a little bit, but how you made decisions to kind of get through that. What was kind of going through your mind? I, I'm just thinking, you know, you said fifty thousand customer refunds, and that one I imagine that came with potentially 50,000 complaint emails or complaint messages. So it's just that barrage of of communication, which is all negative, right? And then you've got, obviously, you know, people uh, coming to you to try and get their money and, you know, you email some PayPal and things like that. You've got your manufacturer saying, you know, I can't, you know, produce anymore. And I'm just thinking that just sounds like, you know, many people might just think I, I would try and run away from that. They might try and dig themselves, a, you know, a hole and just hide away because it sounds extremely kind of overwhelming. I'm just wondering how you managed to get through that, and what was your process of you you, you used the word crisis management earlier. What was your approach to crisis management? So, luckily, I wasn't going through this alone. Right, it wasn't like. Jeff's business and only Jeff was in it. I was partners with a few other people. And so we could commiserate and going through that. And I can speak to that from the military days. When you go through a crisis of sorts together with other people, it builds a bond and that bond is not easily broken. And the reason that happens is because you went through something that no one else can experience or has experienced. And you went through it together in a way that, you know, it helped you build this trust in another person. And when you have trust in another person and they have trust in you, it really does help to see you through um, you know, to the other side. And the other thing that we have to remember is that life will go on, right? No matter how terrible the situation is, right? The sun is still going to come up and life is still going to go on. It may not be pretty. It may not be fun. It may not be the life we expected. It may not be the life we lived yesterday but it's going to continue. And so to tuck your head in the sand and run away from it and pretend like it didn't happen, it unfortunately gives you, it's an excuse that a lot of people can take, but it deprives you of the ability to learn and to grow. And 
I think that would be a crime against anyone who's going through any sort of crisis of any sort, um, whether it's business failure or personal or otherwise. Because if you if you run away and you tuck tail, in essence, that's cowardice, right? I, let's just call it what it is. And we used to actually shame people for that because we wanted people to not do that. Because if you will do that in this situation, is there another time where I can't trust you and I can't have, you know, I can't put my life on in, in your hands? I can't, you're not going to be like, this is why relationships fall apart. Like it's a lack of trust um, that, that happens over time because of certain propensities. But if you prove to me that you will stick through this and you will be here and you will go through this and and especially if you're going through it with somebody else that trust and that bond that's built is is damn near impenetrable and you've also given yourself the chance to learn and to grow and to face things head on and to get stronger and as a result get the ability to do better next time right you you earn that accolade right we may not be talking today if my business hadn't failed or if it had failed and I ran away, right? So um, Napoleon Hill, and was it, I can't remember, but it, I think it was Napoleon Hill. Um, every adversity plants with the seed for opportunity, right? And so that adversity is a chance for us to grow and get better. And anybody who's never faced adversity in, our, in their lives may not agree with that or may not know, but my that is that most people who have never faced adversity have never really succeed, um, succeeded and achieved anything of note. So did I want to? Yeah, there were definitely times. Yeah, of course I wanted to from time to time. But would I be able to look in the mirror and reflect back and say, yeah, I, I'm okay with this? The answer is no. You know, I needed to figure it out. And, you know, you learn throughout that whole process that money isn't everything. You will find a way to to persevere and you will find a way to get back on. You just got to keep waking up one day, put one foot in front of the other. Did you use any of your kind of experience or tactics from the military when dealing with that kind of crisis? I mean, yes and no. The The military crises is a little bit different because it's in your face. It's, it's very, very high pressure. It's right now. Things need to happen today, immediately. And so you learn how to take action. So from that perspective, yes. Uh, on the other hand, um, what this required was distance, right? I needed to distance myself from the problem to figure out how are we going to fix this? And my business partner, Greg, and I, we talked about it all the time. It's like, ah, what are we going to do? How are we going to overcome this? What should we be focusing on? And the, the, for us, the, the answer just kept coming back over and over and over again, bigger and louder and bolder, which was, You've got to finish building this e-commerce platform. You've got to go raise capital for it. You've got to find a way to make this thing succeed. This is how you get out of this problem, right? You continue pushing forward. You learn the process of doing this better than you have before. And so I'd say that that ability to just keep moving forward might have been born into me through the military but the thing that the military doesn't give you is that space to think about the problem that just happened. Not really. I mean, when you do a critique and you sit around a table after everything's happened and everything's said and done, and you're trying to fix it for, and prevent it from happening in the future. That's one thing. But when you are still in that crisis, it's like, okay, this sucks, but you know, I'm not going to get on there and read every single hate mail that's coming through. Like That's just going to drain my energy. No problem. So we're not going to do that. Let somebody else deal with that. And you know, we're going to let attorneys try and take the brunt of the force from the attorneys of the creditors coming after us. Yeah, there's there's a lot. I mean, I'm not gonna lie, there were times that I would punch my steering wheel and at one time I think there was a hole in the wall in my office. So, you know, took it out in, in my own ways. But um it was never a question of will I get back on that horse? It was when. What do you think your biggest mistake was on on that business? Do you think you scaled too quickly? Yeah, hundred percent. Um Scaling up too fast was was definitely a mistake because it didn't allow us the opportunity to go out there and do the quality control. I think quality control was actually the biggest problem. Um, but when things are good, you tend to ignore the little things that you know you should do, right? It's not urgent right now. It's important. It's not urgent. But since it's not urgent, we're not going to do it right today. Was there any other m mistakes that you maybe look back on and, and regret that you didn't do or carry out? Yeah, I mean, misplaced trust is a big one. You know, when you 
blindly trust somebody because you think your interests are aligned, that's a really, really sloppy move. And we realized this. It was definitely something we should not have done. Um, you know, personal guarantees, I'd also really recommend people stay away from those <laughs> at all costs in business. Uh, there's lots of challenges that come with that when things don't go right. And when we sign a personal guarantee, we, of course, think everything's going to go well. But there's a real reason why the professionals that are in the business and at the tops of their games um, try to avoid ownership or uh, culpability or responsibility for anything, right? You want to try and distance yourself personally from that so you can continue to operate your life, even if the entity itself goes down. So those are some of the big things. We, luckily, that one, I didn't have too much personal responsibility or culpability to. Unfortunately, all the American Express cards were in my name, so I had to deal with all that. But, right. you know, aside from those those few things, you know, there's all sorts of little things along the way. You know, did we have the right software? Did we have the right tracking system? Did we have the right, um, you know, customer relationship management tools? All of those little things come into play for sure. But, you know, the big ones were, you know, misplaced trust, lack of quality control, and trying to scale too fast without those foundational pieces in place. And from those kind of lessons, or whether there was other lessons that you kind of took forward into your future businesses, how did this, you know, horrible kind of situation, what lessons and experience did then that give you that you could utilize later on down the line to, you know, help build your other businesses and achieve success? I'm a lot more cautious now, put it that way. Um, taking caution and precautions are, are vital to longevity and I'm much more risk adverse, you know, when we were just blowing and going, it was easy to say, yeah, we're going to take the first class trip over to New York city to go meet with this person because we think it's going to be great. And let's, let's strike a deal up with them and get this going. Cause everything we touch and turns to gold, like it's easy to get into that mindset. Um, now I am even reluctant to take on clients if I don't think that I'm going to be able to help. I'm very reluctant to do anything that I haven't spent a decent amount of time talking about or working with my wife on or my business partners to figure it out. Like we're not going to just jump in head first to anything without doing our due diligence properly. And, uh, you know, luckily I have a company that's designed to help with that. So that helps. And from the, from your kind of success in the business, what have, in terms of your achievements, what have you taken from that failure that's then helped you succeed and, and you know, have those achievements? Because you mentioned about caution and, you know, some people might think that caution isn't always a good thing in, in you know, being, you know, an entrepreneur. Well, I mean, I would say that, that if, you do, if you're investing your time or money with somebody who's not cautious at all, then you're just setting yourself up for failure, right? Mm. Um, risk management is is and has been a big part of my life for over 20 years. However, when you throw some of those basic principles aside, you set yourself up for failure. And risk management, meaning contingency plans, what happens if this doesn't work? Um, do we test before we invest? Those types of things. Are we building the right team? Are we doing trial periods with with people and software and technology? Um, are we watching long enough to get a good feel for how somebody or something actually works before going full-fledged into it? Those types of things are really important. I think that entrepreneurs need to be mindful of that as well, right? Like an investor looking at an entrepreneur is, you know, they're putting up their money. And some of them are looking at it as, this is my money to retire on. So if you lose this money, I don't retire, right? You need to take that seriously. That's a really important thing. Um, th there's a lot of other principles that go along with with being cautious that I think are really vital for people to understand, which is when I say be cautious, it's in who you hire, right? Who do you surround yourself with? Where do you spend your time? Who do you give your energy and attention to? Do you have principles and core values in your business that you will stand by and you will not violate, right? And that's what happened to me is I violated a core principle of mine, which was trust but verify. And that violation is ultimately what led us to an issue that we have. Because um, if we could have verified, oh no, it turns out 
the quality of this stuff is terrible and you can only do a thousand units a week instead of a hundred thousand, like you said, okay, we're going to change our plans a little bit, right? So identifying those principles, Ray Dalio talks about this. He has principles for life and principles for, for business and investing. And I think it's, it's a heavy read, but it's a great read for, for a lot of people. Um, you know, if you don't have principles, then what are you standing on, right? Like a principle is a foundation and your principles should build your core values inside of a business. And if your core values are not there, how do you bring on people that align with you? And people don't give enough credence to the core values of their business. They think, oh yeah, well, honesty, integrity, transparency, there we go. Those are our core values. It's like, oh, come on, but what do those actually mean to you, right? Because a core value is something that it's inviolate, right? You will not go against that. Principles are the same way. Um, and people that don't have principles are not a good fit for me. People that don't have core values are not a good fit. And if their core values don't align with mine, it's not a good fit. And if I were to look back and analyze and assess all of my failures, that's where it came down to. I violated principles and core values that I held near and dear. No, it's great, great advice and some good um, books, tips that I will put in the uh, show notes as well. So what advice would you give to kind of new entrepreneurs um, about handling the the fear of failure you, you kind of mentioned the fear of failure earlier as something that you faced and thought about when you were kind of you know in your early teens but what would you say to people that you know obviously not in their early teens are thinking about you know maybe starting a business or have started a business but they're still worried about failing yeah fear is a, an anxiety or um, that's built up. It's a, it's an adrenaline. It's a hormone, right? That is built up because you do not know what the outcome is going to be, right? Um, sometimes the fear is, I know what the outcome is going to be. I definitely don't want to do that, right? Jumping off a bridge into a you know dry riverbed is an example. Like I'm afraid of getting up on top of that bridge and going to jump off because I know what's going to happen. But generally, in this case, it's fear of the unknown. It's fear of what happens if I do this and it doesn't work out. What happens if people don't like me because I do this. And here's what I would say to that. Um, the way that I overcame fear in most areas of my life was I did things that were maybe a little bit dangerous, maybe a little bit risky, but were not related to the thing I was doing, right? So for example, I became a scuba diver in the Navy. That was not an easy feat, right? In fact, I got passed over four times before they finally sent me to the school and then I passed and I was, I was happy about it. But I had to endure what I would call failure in, in other areas, right? Not being good enough to pass the uh, physical fitness test to be a SEAL, not being fast enough as a runner, not being able to do all these things. And ultimately I overcame those doing one little thing at a time, right? Eventually I was in charge of the athletic um, division of our boat. I was in charge of making sure 300 recruits in the military were um, in shape. I was in charge of this, I was in charge of that. And all of those, we went through the curve, right? All of those took me being afraid in the beginning and not knowing what was going to happen, but they were so small risks and such little risks in the grand scheme of things that I was able to do that. And then you build up this risk tolerance, the more you do that, right? So the guy who can go ahead and be a halo jumper and jump out of an airplane at 30,000 feet and dive straight into the ocean, you know, and then go and fight in combat, their risk tolerance and their fear tolerance is astronomical, right? Versus the person who is terrified of the ocean and never goes anywhere near water for fear of the ocean, even though they might live in Oklahoma, right? That person has a, a, an unsubstantiated, ridiculous fear. And the only way they're ever going to get to the ocean is by testing and trying little things here and there. Eventually, they'll get to the point of like, if they want to anyway, they have to believe that they can and want to do it. Eventually, they'll say, okay, it's not as scary as I thought. And that's what entrepreneurship is, right? It's doing one little thing after another and realizing that each of those little things is not as scary as you thought. And then eventually you get to that point of like, okay, I can do this. Now, does that mean you quit your job when you have a mortgage and three kids and a marriage to take care of? No, <laughs> not if you haven't proven a little bit of success first, but you start small and you build upon that success. And have you got any kind of examples about, you know, activities and risky, um, things that people or entrepreneurs could could get involved with to build their risk tolerance up? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it really depends on where everybody's starting from, right? Um, most people 
unfortunately, like I said, they don't give themselves the, the, the grace and the benefit of time to achieve anything. I think it was Tony Robbins said, you know, we overestimate what we can achieve in one year and we underestimate what we can do in five. And we are such creatures of living in the now that we forget that Rome wasn't built in a day, right? It, and if anybody knows about the history of actually building Rome, they don't just know the saying, they know that it was centuries of getting to that empire, right? Um, and so we need to take that same approach in our lives. So for example, if somebody is terrified of public speaking, and I wasn't terrified of it, but I was terrible at it, right? Um, then what do you do? Well, you start going to networking events where you don't have to speak, but maybe you talk to people and you start to get your voice. Maybe you start coming on podcasts where I'm only talking to you. And so uh, it's not public speaking. It's just us having a conversation. You start doing little things here and there. And over time, those little things become more and more like you might be getting on TikTok every single day and forcing yourself to get on TikTok and talk about something. And maybe you go to chat GBT and you say, okay, give me 30 topics to talk about in X category that I can talk about over the course of the next 30 days. Right. And so you do something like that. Say, okay, this is kind of scary for me, but at the end of the world, end of the day, most people are never going to see your TikTok, right? Mm -hmm. Like, let's be honest. If you're starting from zero, you probably don't have hardly any friends. It's not like you're going out there and going to put something out in front of a million people. You might get 10 views, right? Are you okay with 10 people maybe not loving everything you say? Right? Are you okay with going to a networking event and not being the shining star of the room? And then you do those little things over and over. Um, outside of that, you know, get into sports. Go go climb a mountain, not not like, you know, Everest or anything like that, but go on a hike, right? If you're one of those people that, you know, you're in the backyard or in the backyards or mountains like here, then go get involved in nature. Go do something. Go, you know, for some people, it, it might be camping. It's terrifying to them, right? Mm -hmm. Well, okay, you don't start with going camping, but you maybe start with going for a hike or going for a drive in the country or going for a walk in a, a wooded area. Like, just do the things that get you out of your comfort zone a little bit. If you do that every single day for a year, you will be a completely different person a year from now. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, lo I love that that quote that says growth happens outside the comfort zone. So yeah, mm -hmm. completely, completely right. So kind of last question, if you could go back in time and erase that failure from happening, so erase that business collapse from ever happening, would you do that? You know, <laughs> The amount of crisis that I had to go through after that, between that and the divorce and losing the house and you know, all of that, that was miserable. But that's actually not the thing that I would change. You know, losing the business sucked. It absolutely sucked. But man, it gave me a great story, right? Like, I'd like to think that you enjoy the story, at least. I know a lot of other people enjoy the story when they hear that. Like, oh, thank God it wasn't me, right? But um, in, in the military, we talk about that. Man, like, yeah, this is going to make a hell of a story. So let's get her done. But, you know, for me, I wouldn't have changed that part of it. I probably would have gone back and realized I need to stand up, stand my ground a little bit more on some of my thoughts on this. But I wouldn't have necessarily gone back and said, okay, we're not going to do this or don't do it at all. Or, you know, let's not scale up. I would have said, okay, we got to go back and fix a couple of things we mentioned already. But, you know, going through that whole process, painful as it was, um, it really afforded me a lot. And I got to experience what life was like when you, you know, can travel for free around the world and first class. It was amazing. So it's all worth it. All the pain was worth it for some um, first class travel. Well, it, it's, it's a little bit of that. It's also, here's the other thing about being an entrepreneur that, uh, it, and people's belief systems. Until you have been in a situation where you actually watch something happen that you did not believe could happen before, you will continue to not believe that that thing could happen. I now know I can make $3 million a month selling stuff online without ever meeting a customer, without ever talking to somebody. I know we can do that. And we've done it. We've done it several times, actually. I know that I can go out there and I can raise millions of dollars because I've done it, right? I've experienced it. I've seen it. And so going through it, it wasn't necessarily the, you know, the perks that came with it were great, right? Getting to go and, you know, stay in the suites up in, in Las Vegas and, you know, travel the world first, amazing, right? But more uh, valuable than that was the ability and the to to get into a situation where I could see something happen that I didn't believe could happen before, which has expanded my belief system exponentially, 
so that now I know what I am capable of. That was more important. Mm, great. So we always wrap up on a quick fire round. So this is short questions and short answers. So first question, failure is? Miserable. <laughs> <laughs> What's your life's mission? Uh, to live a, a, a life of purpose, freedom, and autonomy and show others how to do the same. What's one piece of advice that you'd want to give to others on your deathbed? Man, that's that's one one little piece of advice. Uh, go experience life. Name one habit that keeps you resilient. Working out regularly. If you could be immortal, would you take it? Ooh, <laughs> struggle with that one all the time. Um, yeah, I probably would. I, I'm too curious to see what the future holds for this world. What's one surprising fact that not many people know about you? You're right. This is a fire round. One surprising fact. Um, surprising fact. Jeez. I went for an entire year doing that thing I was talking about earlier, trying to do networking events so I could start speaking. Went for an entire year doing events every other week where one person would show up in the room that I would speak to to try and start building my business. It's embarrassing. Sounds, sounds intense. And who could you recommend uh, as a, a guest you think I should have on? Oh, my business partner, Greg Ryder, would be great. But um, Bernd Oldman was is one of my business partners. He was partners with Tommy Hilfiger, so he'd be yeah. a good guy to probably talk about. Sure, I'm sure he's got some good stories. Uh, amazing. Well, um, thank you so much for for being here and Jeff and and sharing all of your stories and you know those difficult moments and for all of your honesty and and transparency. Yes, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me here. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Take care. Thank you for listening to Beyond the Fail. Really hope you enjoyed this episode and learned something new. Please do subscribe to the show and leave us a review. It really does help us to grow and to reach more people. Do follow us on social media too. We're at Jeswood on Instagram and at Beyond the Fail on YouTube and also on Linktree. Thanks again and see you soon.